Hello, and welcome back to Sudoku Swami's Pencil and Paper Method. Today, before we solve a puzzle from start to finish at the end of this video, we're going to talk about a much overlooked way of finding hidden singles. I'm sure you all know about cross-hatching. This is one of the most basic Sudoku strategies of all and was probably the very first thing you learned how to do when you started solving puzzles. But there is another slightly different way to find hidden singles. And if you are not using it constantly and vigorously, you are totally missing out. I like to call this method side hatching because instead of moving up and down the rows and columns, you kind of attack them from the sides. I touched upon this technique back in lesson number eight in this series, but because most people simply ignore it or find it difficult to identify, I want to go over it more thoroughly here because believe me when I tell you, it is really worth knowing what to look for and how to use it. And then at the end of this video, we're going to do something completely different from the previous pencil and paper lessons. We're going to solve a puzzle from start to finish without entering a single candidate, okay? But for right now, let's go over to the puzzle board and I'll show you what I mean by side hatching. Now I'm not going to waste time explaining or reviewing cross hatching for comparison because if you don't already know how to do that, please go back and watch lesson number eight in this series. Here in this diagram, I want you to focus your attention on block one. And we can immediately see that there can be no other twos in row one because of this two, and there can be no other twos in column one because of this two, right? These are the only twos interacting with block one. So at first glance, we might think that any one of these three cells in block one could contain a two. But because there are three of them, this is not a conjugate pair, so we wouldn't actually fill them in if we were solving a puzzle. I'm filling them in here for demonstration purposes only, okay? But now, upon closer inspection, if we zero in on row three, this two down here in row nine, column one, will prevent a two from going into this cell, and this two in column six will prevent a two going into this cell. Now here is the tricky one. Notice that this two in block three prevents a two from going into any one of these three cells, which is easy to overlook if you are concentrating on block one. So that means there is only one cell left in row three for a two to go, and that is right here. Now these two cells could theoretically contain a two according to the basic rules of Sudoku because at the moment they are not blocked from containing a two by the presence of a two anywhere else in the puzzle. But it doesn't matter. There is only one cell left in row three for a two. So that fact overrides the presence of those other candidate twos and thus we know a two must go into this cell and you can enter it just like that. Now that's pretty much all there is to side hatching. It seems pretty simple, but it's not always easy to identify because the relevant numbers may be out of your immediate or narrow scope of vision or focus. Like this two way down here, or this two way up here. You might not see them if you are focusing your attention over here. That's why you need to always be looking at the whole puzzle for as many implications as you can find. Now, if you were using a computer app that featured full-on automated candidate lists and colored candidate filters, these hidden singles that are the result of side hatching would readily show themselves without your having to sniff them out on your own. But with a pencil and paper puzzle, finding hidden singles and naked singles is always going to be your responsibility. And don't forget, a conjugate pair, a naked pair, a naked triple, or any subset really, can rule a column or a row just as easily as a solved cell. For instance, if there were a conjugate pair on two here in column six, If we knew that one of these two candidate twos had to be true, it would be the same thing as having a two placed in this column. It would still prevent a two from going into this cell. 
And likewise, if there were a naked pair of 1 and 2 up here in block 3, it would still prevent a 2 from going into any one of these three cells. It would accomplish the same thing. And likewise, if there were a naked triple down here in column 1 of 2, 5, and 8, that would still prevent a 2 from going into this cell, etc., etc. Unfortunately, none of the examples I'm about to show you contain these types of variations, but I just want you to be aware of what is possible and what to look for, okay? All right, here are some real examples and some real puzzles. Now here in this puzzle, because of this one in column three and this one in row three, it may look like we can enter a conjugate pair of ones into these two cells. Neither one of those cells is blocked by another one in the puzzle. But upon closer inspection, if we take a look at row one, we see that this one in column three blocks this cell, and this one in column five blocks this cell, and this one all by itself blocks all three of these cells. So there is only one place left in row one for a one to go, and that is right here. So this one, even though it is not blocked by a one, is inconsequential. This one up here in row one, column one, has to be the solution to that cell because there has to be a one placed in row one, and that's the only place left for it to go. So we can enter it just like that. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, here in this puzzle, let's take a look at row seven. We see that this four blocks this cell, and this four blocks these two cells. So the only place left for a four in that row is right there, okay? Even though it looks like a four could go into any one of these three cells, we know a four has to go into this cell because it's the only remaining cell in row seven, and so we can enter it just like that. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, here in this puzzle, let's take a look at row two. And we see that this five down here blocks this cell, and this five blocks this cell, and this five over here blocks these two cells, leaving only one place left for a five in row two, and it's right there. Now, even though it may look like a five could go into one of these two cells, because neither one of them is blocked by a five anywhere else in the puzzle, we know that this cell must contain the five in block two, because it's the only place left in row two for a five to go, and you can enter it just like that. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, once again, let's take a look at row two. This seven blocks these two cells, and this seven blocks this cell, and this seven blocks this cell. So that means there's only one place left in that row for a seven to go, and it's right there. And again, there's nothing preventing this cell from being a seven because no seven blocks that cell, but we know that this one has to be the solution to that cell because it's the only place left in row two for a seven to go. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, here in this puzzle, this one blocks all of column one. So that means in block seven, any one of these three cells could contain a one because they're not blocked by any other one in the puzzle. But if we take a closer look at row eight, we'll see that this one blocks this cell, and we'll see that this one blocks this cell, and this one all the way up here blocks this cell. That's why you have to look at the whole puzzle. And so there's only one cell left in row eight for a one to go, and that's right here. Even though either one of these cells could contain a one, this one has to be the solution because that's the only cell remaining in row eight that can contain a one, and you can enter it just like that. All right, next. All right, this time let's look at row one. We see that this four blocks this cell, and we see that this four all the way down here blocks this cell, and this four blocks these two cells because they are in the same block. So that means there's only one place left for a four to go in row one, and it's right there. And again, one of these two cells could contain a four because they're not blocked by any other fours, but this one must be the solution to that cell in block one because it's the only place left in row one for a four to go, and you can enter it just like that. All right, let's go to the next one. Now, I just realized that all these examples are in the rows, but just know that this technique can also be applied to the columns in exactly the same way. You just have to turn it on its side. So let's do a couple more, and then we'll get to our puzzle. 
So let's take a look at row two, and we see that this six blocks this cell, this six blocks all three of those cells because they're in the same block, and this six all the way down here blocks this cell. So that means the only cell left in block three that can contain a six is right here. And again, either one of these cells could be a six because they're not blocked by a six anywhere else, but this has to be the solution to that cell in row two, and we can enter it just like that. Okay? All right, let's do one more. All right, here because of this five, this five, and this five, it looks like we can enter a conjugate pair of fives in these two cells. But if we look a little closer, we see that this five up here blocks this cell, this one up here blocks this cell, and this five in block six blocks all three of these cells, leaving only one place left in row six for a five to go, and that's right here. So even though this cell could be a five, this one has to be the solution because it's the only cell left in row six that can contain a five, and we can enter it just like that. All right, I think that's enough examples, so let's go ahead and solve today's puzzle. So here's our puzzle for today, and as promised, we're going to solve it without entering a single candidate, which means we're going to have to use our memory a little more than usual. Now, I know it looks like there are a lot of givens, but oddly, this puzzle is rated at about twice the difficulty level as any of the other puzzles we have solved so far. So it should give us a good challenge. I chose it mainly because it provides several good examples of side hatching. So here we go. We've got an 8 here, an 8 here, and an 8 here. So that tells us a conjugate pair of 8s can go into these two cells, right? But upon further inspection, we see that this 8 in column 1 blocks this cell, and this 8 over here in block 3 blocks this cell. Now that's kind of hard to see because it's on a diagonal, but this red cell cannot contain an 8 because there's already an 8 in block 3. So that means there's only one cell left in row 1 for an 8 to go, and that is right there. Now even though this cell in row 2 looks like it could contain an 8, this one up here in row 1 has to be the solution, because that's the only place left for an 8 to go in row 1. That is side hatching. Now I know I said we weren't going to enter any candidates, but in order for me to enter a number into a cell, I have to enter the candidate itself first, so those will be the only ones we enter, but only for a split second, okay? So let's get rid of those colors. And now we have to remember that these two cells are a naked pair of 3 and 7. And we need to remember that for later because we're not marking any candidates. All right, now I want you to look at block 5. This cell is surrounded by a lot of numbers, so let's check it out. It can see a 1, 2... It cannot see a 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. So we know this is a naked single of 3 because it can see an instance of all the other numbers. And likewise, this cell down here can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 9. And it cannot see an 8, so it has to be an 8 because it can see all the other numbers beside 8. So we know these are naked singles. So let's get rid of this 8 and enter the 3. And so now what we're left with is a naked pair in column 5 of 1 and 8. And since there's a 1 here, this must be the 8, but we already knew that because it was a naked single. Which leaves a 1 to go in this cell, either as a full house or the other half of that naked pair. All right, I want to stop right here. I know this lesson is about side hatching, but when you are solving puzzles with pencil and paper, with no candidates filled in except those that we decide to enter carefully and economically, the ability to find naked singles like this by virtue of what I call a disjointed full house is not only huge, it is absolutely imperative. Without automated and complete candidate lists, there is about a 0% chance that you will be constructing any continuous loops or finding a sous de coq pattern or using almost locked sets or forcing chains, etc., okay? So you need to use the stuff that you can actually see to your best advantage. And this means you have to pursue side hatching and disjointed full house naked singles with a vengeance, like your life depended on it. 
That's the only way you're going to be able to solve difficult puzzles with only your pencil and an eraser. A regular full house is easy to see. If there is just one empty cell remaining in a particular house, it is a no-brainer. It can only be one thing. But the disjointed kind of full house is a lot harder to see. You have to ferret them out, and it takes a keen eye. And the better you get at it, the better solver you're going to be. It's as simple as that. Okay, let's move on. So now because of this one and this one, we can crosshatch a one into that cell. That must be a one. And now because of this one and this one, and because of these two ones, we can crosshatch a one into this cell. But let's go back and use side hatching. This one blocks this cell, and this one blocks these two cells, and this one blocks this cell, leaving only one cell left in column four for a one to go, and it's right there, and you can enter it just like that. Now this time we get the same result from cross-hatching or side-hatching, and there are no options. All right, let's move on. And likewise, we've got a five in row one, a five in row three, a five in column one, and a five in column two, which means a five must go into that cell. And again, let's look at this from the side hatching perspective. This five blocks that cell. And this five blocks these two cells, leaving only one cell left for a five to go in column three. And it's right there, and we can enter it just like that. All right, now let's take a look at the nines. We've got a nine in row three, a nine in row one, a nine in column nine, and a nine in column seven. So there's only one place left in block three for a nine, and that's right there. Okay? And now because of this nine in row four, and this one in row five, and because of this one in column three, we know a nine must go into this cell. And now we have eight of the nine nines placed. So that means there's only one place left to go in block seven for a nine, and that's right there. Okay? But let's use side hatching to put that in. So let's undo that and remove those colors. This nine blocks these three cells, and this nine blocks that cell, and this nine blocks this cell, leaving only one cell left in column one for a nine, and that's right there, and we can fill it in as the solution to that cell. So as you can see, side hatching works exactly the same way in the columns as it does in the rows. Now there's a couple more things we need to make a mental note of before we go on because we're not entering candidates. Now because of this one and this one, we know that a conjugate pair of ones must go into those two cells. And because of this one, this one, and this one, we know that another conjugate pair of ones must go into these two cells. Now those four cells form an X-wing on one, so we need to remember that for later. Now let's take a look at row five. There are only two empty cells, so they must be a naked pair of four and six. And then we had our old naked pair in row one of three and seven. So we've got a naked pair of three and seven, a naked pair of four and six, and an X-wing on one. All right, so let's move on. Now this two rules column nine, so there's only one cell left in block three for a two, and it has to go right there. So we can enter that. And now with that two in place, because of this two, this two, and this two, and this two, we know that a two must go into this cell. But let's go back and solve this with side hatching. This two blocks these three cells in column eight, and this two blocks this cell, and this two blocks this cell. So there's only one cell left in column eight for a two, and it's right there. Okay? So that's a two no matter which way you look at it. And now because of this two in row five and this two in column three, we know a conjugate pair of twos must go into those two cells. And because of these two twos up here in row one and row two, another conjugate pair of twos must go into those two cells. So that forms an X-wing on two. So now because these two twos rule row four, we know that a two cannot go into that cell. And because this two rules column four, we know a two cannot go into this cell, so we can put a two right there. But again, let's go back and view this from the side hatching perspective. This two blocks these two cells, and our conjugate pair of twos blocks this cell, 
and this two or this two block this cell. So this cell has to be a two no matter how you slice it and we can enter it just like that. Now remember when we entered this two in block three that left only two empty cells so they have to be a naked pair of three and seven. Those are the only digits left to complete block three. And don't forget we also had a 3-7 naked pair in row 1. So all three of these cells are 3 and 7. So don't forget that. Now because one of these has to be a 7, there can be no other 7s in column 9. So that means this cell cannot be a 7. Now if we look at this 7 and this 7, they rule row 5 and column 3. So that means one of these cells has to be a 7. But that was already a conjugate pair on 2, so this becomes a naked pair of 2 and 7. So they rule row 4. There can be no other 2s or no other 7s in row 4, so these two cells cannot be a 7. And this cell cannot be a 7 because of this 7 here in row 5, so that can't be a 7. And this 7 blocks this cell from being a 7, leaving only one cell left in block 6, for a 7 and that's right there and so we can enter a 7 into that cell. But again let's look at this from the side hatching perspective. This naked pair of 2 and 7 blocks this cell from being a 7 and this 7 blocks this cell from being a 7 and this cell blocks both of these cells from being a 7. So no matter how you look at it this cell has to be a 7 because it's the only cell left in column 8 for a 7 to go so we can fill it in just like that. And now this 7 blocks this cell, and this 7 blocks this cell, so we know a 7 must also go into that cell right there. And by side hatching, we know that this 7 blocks these two cells, and this 7 blocks this cell, and this 7 blocks these two cells. So this is the only place left in row 8 for a 7 to go, and we can fill it in just like that. All right, so now would be a good time to review what we know. We've got a 3-7 naked pair in row 1, and we've got another 3-7 naked pair in block 3 in column 9. Okay? And then we've got a naked pair of 2 and 7 in these two cells, but we also have an X-wing on 2 in these 4 cells. And then we had a naked pair of 4 and 6 in row 5, right? And now there's only 2 cells left in block 5, so they have to be 8 and 6, so that's a naked pair. And in block 8, these two cells have to be 4 and 6. So these two cells are 4 and 6 in row 5. And in block 8, these two cells are also 4 and 6. And then we had our X-wing on 1 in these four cells. Okay, we all clear on that? Now the next move is kind of tricky, and I want you to stay with me, but it's going to be the key to solving the whole puzzle. Now remember, in block 4, we had a naked pair of 2 and 7, right? So that means these three cells have to be a triple. And what are they? They're going to be 3, 4, and 6. But because there's a 4 here, this cell can only be 3 and 6. And we already knew this cell was 4 and 6. So 3, 4, 6, 4, 6, 3, 6. Now we've got another triple in column 3. And it's the same triple, 3, 4, 6. Okay? But notice that because this cell does not contain a 3, one of these two cells must contain a 3 because they're the only places a 3 can go in that column. So that means this cell down here, which is part of our triple, cannot be a 3, and it must also be a 4 and a 6. And don't forget, this cell was a 4 and a 6. We had a 4, 6 naked pair there. So now we've got two naked pairs, 4, 6, 4, 6 in block 8, and 4, 6, 4, 6 in row 8. Now let's take a look at row 9. These three cells are a triple of 4, 6, and 8. But because there's an 8 here, this can only be 4 and 6. So we don't need these two right now. But this is another naked pair of 4 and 6. We've got a 4, 6 in block 7. We've got a 4, 6 in block 8. And we've got a 4, 6 in row 8, and we've also got a 4, 6 in row 5. So now that we know that this is a 4, 6 naked pair in block 7, this has to be a 1, 3 naked pair, right? Because we had an X-wing on the 1, so we know one of these had to be a 1, but now one of them has to be a 3. So let's get rid of those colors. 
And now remember, this was a naked pair of four and six, right? So there can be no other six in row eight. And we've got a six up here, so there can be no other six in column nine. So that means one of these two cells has to be a six, right? Okay, but this was a four, six naked pair. And if one of these has to be a six, this can only be a four. It cannot be a six. So if this is a four, this is a six. So let's put those in. And now this cell was three and six, so it can't be a six, it has to be a three. And since this was a triple of three, four, six, this has to be a four. And this was also a triple of three, four, six in column three. So this cell has to be a six. And now we had our naked pair of four and six, so this must be a four. And this was a naked pair of four and six in row eight, so this has to be a four. And this cell has to be a six because that was also a naked pair of four and six. So let's enter those. All right? And now this was a naked pair of eight and six, but because this is a six, this has to be the eight, and this has to be the six. So let's enter those. And now we've got a full house in column four, and that has to be a four. Next, we're left with a naked pair of three and eight in these two cells, but because of this eight, this has to be the three, and that has to be the eight. All right, now we had three, seven, three, seven, and three, seven, right? So this is a unique rectangle. This cell cannot be three or seven. This cell has to be the three or the seven, because if this cell was three or seven, it would create the forbidden pattern, and that's not allowed. So this cell cannot be three and seven, and now we know that this is a naked pair of one and three. So one of these has to be a three. So this can't be a three. It has to be a seven. And that's going to solve these four cells. This cell has to be a three. And this was a naked pair of three and seven. So that has to be a seven. And likewise, this has to be a three. So let's go ahead and enter all of those. And now we have a full house. This has to be a six. And remember, these two cells were a naked pair of two and seven. So because of this seven, this has to be the two. And this has to be the seven. And this was an X-wing on two. So that has to be a two. So let's fill those in. And so this can only be a four, right? And now in row four, we've got a naked pair of three and eight. And because of this eight, it has to be three and eight. And now in row six, we've got a naked pair of five and six. But because of this six up here, this must be the five and this must be the six. And now we've got a full house in column seven. That has to be a five. And now remember, these two cells were a naked pair of one and three, right? And in row eight, this also has to be one and three. So this cell cannot be one and three because that would create the forbidden unique rectangle pattern. So this cell has to be one and three. And because there's a one up here, this has to be three, and then one, three, and one. So let's enter those. And then we've got a full house in row seven. That has to be a four. And then a full house in column eight. We have six. And the last cell fitting row nine, column nine, is going to be an eight, and that solves the puzzle. Well, that was kind of a long one. Thanks for hanging in there with me, but at least we got the job done, and the puzzle is solved. Okay, that's going to do it for today. If you enjoyed this video, please click the red subscribe button, the thumbs up icon, and be sure to click the little bell icon if you would like to be notified of new video uploads. And don't forget, if anyone has a puzzle from a newspaper, a magazine, a puzzle book, or whatever that you would like to see me solve in a future video, please send it to me at sudokuswami at gmail.com, okay? In the next lesson, we're going to cut to the chase and solve a puzzle from start to finish without any preliminary tutorials. But we're going to kick it up a notch and do a puzzle that is quite a bit harder than we usually do here, and hopefully it will include examples of everything we have talked about so far. So I hope you will join me for that. Until then, be well and be happy.